بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم I pray that you're well inshallah uh, apologies for my delay. Um, we left the home on time, actually even early, but it was one of those nights. Um, accidents, and at some point I needed to get out of the car to act like a police. We were stuck, so I got out of the car telling this group, please reverse, go here, there, opened up some way, like a hero. Actually, I think there's footage of one of the cars calling me a hero. Because Zahra was filming it, and one of the cars was like, you're a hero. I hope we have that footage. Inshallah, we'll share it in Hey Daddy's WhatsApp group. Um, but I'm really sorry, honestly. I um, really, whatever you wanted to say to me in your mind, I said it to myself. <laughs> the whole time. I gave us a very difficult time in the car, so rest assured, that mission is done. Um, now we can maybe relax a little bit and inshallah enjoy a little bit, a few minutes of um, talking about one of the teachings from uh, our 11th Imam, Imam Askari alayhi salam. If it's okay, I'm going to drink and see what does the water here taste like. It's nice, it's nice. Is it mineral or tap? <laughs> tap water. <laughs> no, it was lovely, it was lovely. Thank you so much. On the way we had water, but I was worried if I have, there may be more delays here. <laughs> so, but now I think we're safe. After the lecture, whatever happens, it's fine. And I don't need this suit anymore, so it's okay. Um, there's one hadith from the Imam, I'll read it um, so I don't make a mistake. I'll read it uh, and then we'll talk about it. Bismillah rahman rahim So the Imam says, and what a beautiful hadith. Um, one of the things you'll see with our um, later Imams, so you see this a lot in Imam, uh, a hadith of Imam Sadiq, Imam Kazim, and in the later Imams, you see this theme being, being very much repeated. And perhaps the reason why they kept emphasizing on this theme, which I'll just mention in a few seconds, is that they were seeing that within the Muslim world, there is a shift happening which they were warning us about. And in, in this hadith, we will see what this warning is. And I hope by the end of the lecture, we will come to the very sad conclusion that the warning uh, didn't really help because we didn't really pay that much to the attention to the warning. But you see this a lot in, in the hadith of the later Imams. For example, if you look at our, one of the most famous book of hadith, we have Usul al-Kafi, right? If you start reading that book, I send the first uh, maybe 150 hadith that you read, they all have a very similar theme and they are talking about this very important um, shift that they see it's happening and they keep telling people, be careful, be careful. Uh, don't do this, do this. Don't be impressed by that, be impressed by this. Now, this hadith that we're reading from the 11th Imam is from these or this category of ahadith that we have. Let me read it for you and then we'll, inshallah, in whatever time we have, try to elaborate on it and open it up. Um, it's also going to be a very, it's going to give you answers to a lot of the uh, issues we you may have in your religious life, um, i.e., why is it that I've been praying for 20, 30 years and not much is changed in my life? 
Just recently, someone was telling me, Sheikh, I've done fasting, I've done, I don't know, prayer, all of this, read the Quran, but I've never felt anything happening. I did Kundalini yoga one session, I felt something. And this is actually a serious point. How come this 20, 30 years of that didn't give him anything? One session yoga and he felt like something's happening. Answer is here. Was that a good build up for the hadith? I think now we're ready. Um, imagine if I couldn't find it now. <laughs> that would have been terrible. But no, I have it. Alhamdulillah, we have it here. So our beautiful, lovely Imam says, ليست العبادة كثرة السيام والصلاة وإنما this إنما is very important we'll come to it إنما العبادة كثرة التفكر في أمر الله Imam says worship or ibada inshallah we need another session to talk about what worship is but for now Imam says worship is not كثرة السيام والصلاة having a lot of fasting and salat prayer not that those are not important. But Imam says, what is the core of worship? That if it's there, then those things will bear fruits. Imam says, what innamo? Innamo means it, 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 it's a kind of exclusivity, right? It says, worship is kathratu tafakur fi amr Allah. It's that reflection on the amr of God. Allah, what is amr? We can talk about it. Um, so some of the Mufassirin of Quran, in order to explain Amr, they refer to that verse. So they say Amr of God, that Imam says, think about Amr of God, is a level of creation uh, that is one level above this world. Hello? I don't want to get into that discussion on what Amr is, all Amr, Amr and all of that. All I want us to reflect on with regards to this hadith is this. That Imam says, if you put in front of me a lot of fasting, a lot of salat, and on this side reflection on the Amr of God, I think this is worship, not that one. Imam Asghari alayhi salam is saying, and this is not just one hadith, like a one-off hadith. Open Usul al Kafi, which is, as I said, by most Shia scholars, one of the most authentic sources of hadith we have is Usul al Kafi. It's one of the four books we have. And start reading there, hadith after hadith with the same theme. A, a person, for example, goes to the Imam, one of the earlier Imams, and he says, I have a neighbor, mm, amazing neighbor, fasts praise a lot of charity and then imam asks him a question see with these kind of questions imam were trying to teach us the priorities so the imam asked him how is his understanding does he know what he's doing what's his understanding of the world why is he doing all of that the person says mm. but he does a lot of charity it's a lot imam says understanding and then imam says see none of that action is going to be raised. If there is not understanding there, the actions will not be that much beneficial. This is the point which is so important for us to know. Take yourself back to that time and let's think about this. Why was it that our ahl bayt kept telling their special companions or the people around them about this issue? In so many different cases, by the way, when they want to explain what worship is, they say, see, worship is not just doing too many actions. It's that tafakkur, that's reflection. When someone comes to ask them, see, I've got this neighbor, such a lovely person, say, no, 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 don't get impressed by that quickly. You don't want to be impressed by someone? First look at their understanding of what they're doing. Then there's another uh, situation in which um, they're asking for leaders. Imam says, if you want to look for a leader, it's not if this person, I don't know, don't look at his actions again. Actions are very necessary, but look at his understanding. Okay. Why was this emphasis there? Because the Imams knew without understanding, your actions will not get you far. 
and they had seen that after the prophet and there is slowly slowly this emphasis on people just doing things without having that deep understanding and the Ahlubayt knew if this goes on for a long time what would be left of religion is a series of actions that people don't know why they're even doing it what is the result of that you spend a lot of your life doing religious things but by the end of it you don't have that much to show for it so you've prayed 20 30 40 years and then if they ask you as a result of that do you feel like you're different to when you were 20 or you must calmer are you nicer at home you're like not really honestly how many of you have heard this that children want to play and the mom is like be quiet dad is fasting what does that mean it means dad is grumpy <laughs> he's fasting if you play and you you make a little bit of noise we don't know what dad will do now a mom would come and say what kind of fasting is this if instead of making you calm it's making you more dangerous for your children right these are serious issues and i'm not judging that dad poor thing he's doing what he was told right but this hadith hadn't reached him my friend if you know what you're doing your fasting wouldn't make you more grumpy your fasting is there for you to get energy what did what does the quran say wasta'inu bi sabr wa salat quran says sabr and salat sabr a lot of mufassirin say one clear instance of it is fasting so quran is saying go to salat and fasting to get istana to get energy and help so it's a way of doing there's a way of doing salat and fasting you go to it you get energy but if you don't know what you're doing you go to salat and fasting and you're spending the energy you've had in the day on them i've mentioned this example many times how many muslim gatherings are there you a few people gather in each other's house and they're like let's do the salat so we don't need to worry about it anymore get it out of the way we can relax what does that show salat is not seen as something you can go to get energy it's more of a burden let's just get it done because we have to right and the imams were very worried about this because once religion turns into this the spirit of it is gone and it turns into a, something against itself right because you're putting so much energy there and you're not getting much out of it and um please decide salawat So they wanted us to choose a different path. Not that in this new path there wouldn't be a Salat. No. Who is mentioning this Ahadif? The Ahlebayt who loved Salat more than anyone else. Right? One of our Imams, when he was prison, what did he say? He said, well, one of the good things about being in prison is that now I have more time to, to do Salat. But the same person... The same Imam who when he's in prison, he says, now I have more time to worship my God and do Salat and whatnot. He himself says this, if his person prays, but they don't know what they're doing, it's useless. So see, the person who is telling us understanding comes before Salat, he's not a careless person. He's a ma'asum. He's a person who the, for him, the most enjoyable thing in the world is Salat. But he says, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't reflect, it's not going to be valid. Not valid in the fiqh, he says. Valid in the it, you can't find it in your life. And by the way, if you want to know what is the outcome of your religious life, it's very easy. It's not a complicated thing. Just look at your life and see if it created any light in your life or not. If you're going through a difficult time, if you're going for example through a challenge and you prayed if that prayer was a proper prayer then you can find the light it creates in your life you're going for a difficult time that light turns into some peace in your heart 
You're, for example, I don't know, dealing with a challenge with a shortcoming that you want to overcome. You don't have strength. If that salat was real, it should come in the form of strength so you overcome that shortcoming. God says, if salat is done right, it's not like you just do it and you don't know what happened. It will come to your life and start doing things. It gives you strength, it gives you calm, it gives you peace. Today I want to talk about one of the things that if religion is done right, should happen in our life. And then you can see for yourself if it's happening or not. But I don't want you also to feel like I'm attacking us or judging us or saying that we're like terrible people that we're like this. No, we've always tried to do the best that we were told. Bless them, our parents, previous generations. They try to give us the best thing that they thought it's good for us. And we really need to thank it. So I'm not judging us. But I'm saying, don't you want to maybe make a little bit more out of life? It's very much possible. If there's one thing I've learned in my life is that life can be so much nicer when you follow this hadith of Imam Askari alayhi salam. The problem we have, let me be honest with you, I don't know how will this, by the way, come to your heart. You know, we've heard so many lectures. I remember once recently when they invite me for lectures, I'm like, why? <laughs> People have heard so much, you know, our ears are so full of so many talks and lectures. I really don't enjoy giving talks anymore. I was thinking, you've heard so much. But this thing tonight, honestly, it's one of those things that put it in a separate category. If I can manage to bring this to your heart, your life will be different. One of the main problems that happen with us is that we've given up on what life can be. We've tried, if you look at a young person, they're younger, not that experienced, and you tell them about God, initially it's very exciting. You can talk to the creator of the universe. I'm like, wow, that's possible. I can do that, I can talk to God about my problems and whatnot. By the time they're 20, they're 30, because the method we've given them is not that thingy, it's like, yeah, you can talk to the creator of the universe, you know? It's like, yeah, it's something I do, but my life is not different to the one that doesn't believe that much in God. Yani, we have turned this relationship with God into something that the idea is beautiful, but our experience is not matching what we were expecting. Our own experience is that we're 30, 40, 50, 60, where is God? Where have I spoken to God? Maybe one trip to Hajj, I felt a little bit of something. And we've kind of become okay with this is, this is what it is, Dige. But it's not the way it is. It can be so much fun. This life is magical. I really think if people, if you spend just maybe one month following this prescription of Imam Asghari, you honestly, if your life didn't change, then come and say whatever you want to me. Hopefully by then I'll be far from Haidari, so <laughs> I wouldn't hear what you're saying, but I'm sure it's gonna work. Believe me. There's a verse in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, Ayat 118, in other words, 118, that there, God says there's a group of people, why is God not talking to us? Right? Why is God not talking to us? Why is God not sending a sign? And in a lot of workshops I do, that's one of the questions people ask. I wish God would send me a sign. If only God could talk to me. Now, let's see how is God dealing with this thing that people are saying. By the way, think a little bit about what would you say if someone came to you, like your child, and said, Daddy, why is God not talking to me? Hope you keep telling me, talk to God. Why is God not talking to me? Why is he not sending a sign? Think a little bit about how would you respond to your 
uh, child. And the interesting thing is that Quran then says, by the way, these are not the first group of people who have this question. Even people before you, some of them had similar question. Why is God not talking to us? Why is there not a sign? So, it's very interesting. At the time of the Prophet, Quran is telling to the Muslims that you're not the first one who think God is not talking to you. Before you, there were also that people. And now as well, we, after 14 centuries, were in the similar situation. What is Quran's diagnosis? Like, according to Quran, why does this happen? It's a very interesting point. Quran says, you know why you, many of you different generations, thousand years has passed and you still go through the same thing? It says what? There's something your heart is doing that the result of it is this. They did it, the result of it was this. You're doing the same thing. In other words, there's a way of living, there is a way of handling your heart that after a while your heart becomes blind to God's speech and signs. So God is saying, I've been speaking to you and not just you, all the generations of humanity, but there is a way of living that your heart slowly, slowly cannot hear me. It's not that I'm not talking to you or I'm not sending you signs. It's that this way of life you are living is not enabling you to receive the signals or the signs. I.e. signals being sent, there is some issue with the receptor, with the receiver. This is very important by the way if you think about it. God is saying it's very possible to hear me talk to you. That is a very real possible thing. And let me see what's the rest of the verse. Yeah. And God says we've actually got bayan al ayat. It's not just that we send signs. Oh, our signs are so clear. Very clear. Oh. According to this verse, there's two ways of living. In one way, you're like, where is God? At best, you go to a madrasa or your family or religious, they convince you there is a God. But for you, God is always something absent that they've proven to you. You don't hear him, you don't see his signs, you don't see that much his presence in your life. And... You can see even some of the Muslims would go to the Prophet, Muslim, which means they believed in God. But they would go to the Prophet, for example, and say, why is God not talking to us? What does that mean? Their knowledge of God is not direct. They feel like we haven't seen God. It's these type of people who would, for example, go to Imam Ali alayhi salam and ask the Imam, have you seen God? And then the Imam would say, what? Will I ever worship a God I have not seen? So what does that mean? If there's a way of life in which you don't even know if God is someone tells you, you can't talk to him, you can't see him. You don't see the result of this belief in God in your life. You don't feel stronger, you don't feel calmer. But there's also another way of life. The way Imam Ali alayhi salam was living. The way Imam Hassan Askari wants us to live. They say in this way of life, it's not just that God, there are some signs from God. No, God's signs are so clear. Any, in one way of life, you look around and say, oh, where is God? Although we believe in him because if we don't, we'll go to hell. But honestly, where is he? So many people doubting him, so many books saying there is no God. But there's another way of life. You look around, you're like, wow, God is everywhere. It's, it's like that. It's very difficult to be somewhere in the middle. You're either living this way, and then God becomes so present that you can't miss him. As Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Dua Arafah says, 
the eyes that cannot see you, O God, are blind. What does that mean? It means right now, many of us, no judgment by the way, according to Imam Hussein, the eyes of our soul are blind. Because Imam Hussein says, God is so clear that if you can't see him, you should go inside and do some fixing. Does it make sense by the way so far? Yeah. How are you feeling about this? Um, I, I know you can't really answer, so I'll try to form it into a yes, no question, and then use salawat to respond. By the way, salawat is such a beautiful thing. It's again one of those things that we can either do it, say 1,000 salawat, and it won't get you anywhere if you don't know what you're doing. This is, by the way, this message of the Imams, which I said, honestly, do yourself a favor once and read Usul al kafi the first bit. Hadith after hadith after hadith, the Ahl Bayt keeps saying, try to understand what you're doing. So I want to tell you that salawat is only possible if you, if you love the Prophet. How can you love the Prophet? You should know what he says. In the moment of salawat, we establish a connection to the Prophet. Although I don't want to get to that. That's another lecture. But if you are feeling like you get what I'm saying so far, please recite salawat. <laughs> if you feel like, I don't know what is he doing. What's the point of this? Life is okay as it is. Why should we listen to this discussion? You don't need to recite salawas. Just keep that in your heart. <laughs> Inshallah, may Allah guide us all. No, I'm joking. Honestly, I wish we had a time for Q&A or interactive discussion. I'm very much interested in hearing why you would think that. But just for the sake of, because menbar is not meant to be interactive apparently, we'll move on. But I very much care if that's why you're feeling, another session, inshallah, we'll come and talk about it. Because it's a very important shift. If we, make, if we manage to make this paradigm shift, believe me, life will not be the same anymore. Imam Reza has a hadith, from the first moment I read this hadith, it became my motto in life. Imam says, um, bless the one who revives our affair. What is reviving your, our affair? Rahmallah imran ahya amrana. What is reviving our affairs? Imam says, it's the one who learns what we are teaching and then goes and sp talk, talks about that with people. But if it was up to here, many people would think, well, we've done it, dig eh? We have went and uh, learned the way of the Ahl Bayt. Now we're teaching it to everyone. Imam Reza but puts a condition. He says, do you want to know if it's actually what we wanted to teach or you've got it a little bit wrong? It's this. If people in nas law alimu mahasina kalamina lattaba'una. If people knew the sweetness, the beauty of our teachings, everyone would have loved to follow it. This is a very interesting criteria. And it shows that we're not there yet. Believe me, most places I go, all I'm seeing is that, let me not finish that. That's a little bit of a negative thought. But it's, it's serious. And it, at the very least, it's showing that not only we haven't managed to show the beauty of ahl Bayt to others, even internally a lot of people are saying, where is the beauty? Right? You're probably more aware of this than me. I've got some really interesting stories. So if I tell you, we'll all start crying tonight. Oh. This became the motto for my life. As ahl Bayt are saying, see, if you get our teachings correctly, because sometimes even getting it a little bit wrong, you know, sometimes a mistake initially could be, let's say, two degrees different. But if you follow this two degrees for a wrong, for a while, the distance is so much. This is where I think we are with the Ahl Bayt right now. 
we need to go back and correct it a little bit. What happens when we correct this a little bit? Believe me, if I did not, if I wasn't sure, if I hadn't seen this, I would not come and talk about it like this. That's another one of my life uh, principles, by the way. I never say something unless I've seen it myself. That's why there's so many topics I haven't given a lecture about. Once I even remember, it was like maybe five, six years ago, I still didn't feel tabacol in my life. I could give lectures about it, but I hadn't felt the power of tabacol in my life. They invited me for the workshop on tabacol. I kept changing the topic. I didn't want to say something I haven't seen in my life. What's the point of giving a lecture about tabacco if the first problem happens in my life? I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? Oh, where's your tabacco, mate? Pass in that night, they kept talking about tabacco. I changed the topic. I was like, tabacco? Do you want to talk about intellect? <laughs> they thought I'm mental, but that was my promise that I'm never going to speak about something I haven't seen. This thing I'm talking to you about tonight, if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't say it with this much conviction. If we go back to the way of the Ahl al-Bayt, believe me, your life will change. Okay, let me give a summary of what I've been saying so far. I said in the Ahadith of Ahl al-Bayt, you see they have this concern, they keep mentioning it over and over again. And I gave you one example of these ahadith from Imam Askari alayhi salam. He said, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Our beautiful, beloved Imam said that Laythat al-ibadah kathratu tafakkur wa kathratu siyam. Imam said, worship is not having a lot of fasting and salat as important as they are. What is ibadah? Kathratu tafakkur fi amrillah. It's that you think and reflect a lot. What is the amr of God? What is, you understand it. This was how we started. I said, this is very important for the Ahl Bayt. That was our first point. The second point was, why is this important? Because if you don't understand what you're doing, if you don't think about who God is, what is your relationship with God, then you go to your salat, your salat doesn't do anything. Why? Salat is a meeting with God. If you don't know who God is, what is the point of that meeting? And this is not me saying, if I said this, you would be like, this sheikh is lazy, he doesn't want to pray, he's making an excuse. But this is Imam Qasim saying, Imam Askari salam saying, these are the people who prayed more than we can ever can. These are not people who didn't love Salat. They loved Salat more than we can imagine. But they said, do you want to love Salat too? Well, go to Salat with understanding. So that's why understanding is prior to that. And there are millions of ahadith, that's a massive exaggeration, at least 150. <laughs> Million is quite similar to 150, right? A lot of ahadith, yani in relatively speaking, we have a lot of ahadith about this topic. And so the Imam says actions, all of that, very important, beautiful, but before you want to go there, fix your relationship with God. Think about God, understand God. That way, then your life will start changing. Then I mentioned the verse of the Quran for you. In that verse of the Quran, a group of people went to the Prophet and said, Prophet John, or actually it's like this. They, the verse says, some people are said. Some people said, that, why is God not talking to us? Why is he not sending a sign? And then Quran says a beautiful thing. He says, you know why this happens to you? There's something up with your heart. Because Quran is also saying the same thing that the Ahl Bayt said. Ahl Bayt said, before you want to go to Salat and whatnot, you need to fix yourself. You need to think, understand. Quran as well saying, if you don't understand well, if you don't do something to your heart, no matter what you do, you will never get the result of your religion. You won't feel like you're talking to God. You won't see God. You won't feel God's presence. Well, why should I care about God's presence? Why should I want to see God? In Baba, that's the whole fun of this world. 
us and this world, believe me, without the presence of God, this world is like a prison. As an, everything changes when God becomes part of your life. We haven't spoken about God enough, honestly, amongst ourselves. Look at the idea of Ahl al-Bayt. If you want to know what the Ahl al-Bayt were really like, what did they care about, what did they want to talk about, go to their Ad-Iyah. What's the difference between a Hadith and an Ad-Iyah? In a Hadith, Imam is talking to someone. When someone is coming asking him a question, Imam has to respond to that. So a lot of the time, Imam is responding to another person. Or he's speaking based on that person's level. But if you want to know what was, for example, Imam Hussein thinking when he was on his own, or Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, what was he thinking when he was on his own? Imam Ali alayhi salam, go read the Ad-Iyah. Because that's when they were talking to God on their own. And then let, let me read a few lines from you. I've got five minutes left. I'll read a few lines from Ad-Iyah for you to see how much that presence of God is important. And if after hearing these lines you got interested, then follow this line from Imam Askari. Imam Askari salam says, worship is this, understand God. If you fix your relationship with God, because most of us, the God you have in your head is not the real God. There's a hadith from the Imam. The Imam says, many of you, the God you have in your mind is a God you've created with your mind. It's not the real God. Well, what happens if my God is not the real God? Baba, it's the real God who has the power. It's the real God who you can rely on. It's the real God that if you talk to will give you peace. But if you go to your salad and talk to the God you've created in your mind, it wouldn't lead to any peace. It wouldn't give you any energy. So Imam says, forget that God you've created in your mind. That is a creation of your own mind. Connect to the real God. What happens when you connect to that real God? Everything changes. Salat changes, life changes, your relationship with everyone changes. Your relationship with world changes. Ilahi. Man He says, God, who is the one who has tasted the sweetness of being in a relationship with you, of your love, and then wanted anything else. What is Imam Sajjad telling us? Boy, there is a way of living. If you know who God really is, from that moment onwards, everything changes. In so many ways, God has been trying to tell us. Inshallah, another talk, I'll talk about this, how through the events in our life, God has been teaching us stuff, better than any theology teacher. You know one of, what is one of the most beautiful things God has been teaching us through our life? You know that moment when you're so happy to be with someone? Let's say you haven't seen your parent, they were in a different country, after 10 years, let's say, for example, they came from Tanzania to visit you in London. That beautiful day when mom is back uh, or he, she comes to visit you. And imagine on that day, whatever food you have, isn't it the best day of your life? Whether you have it just bread, whether you have, I said, no, it doesn't matter, the mom is back. Hello, if you didn't love your parent that much, think of your honeymoon, <laughs> right? Because for me, the most beautiful thing is the smile of my mom. Although I love my wife very much too. <laughs> She's here as well. Bless her. She drove two and a half hours to get us here. So massive respect. Think of that moment. You're with your fiance. You're getting engaged. By the way, the parents are aware of the relationship. It's all with them. You're sitting there. There's the most simple food in front of you. But isn't that the best day of your life? But in another day. Fiance is gone, like in our case. As soon as we got engaged, she went to Hajj. She was very, you know, from early on, she told me God's more important. I was like, beautiful message. But imagine, you're on your own, although even if you have the most beautiful food, is it the same? No. Or, I've even seen, I've had friends who lost their parents, 
And I very much remember that day. One of my friends, when he lost his mom, he told me, Javad, I don't want anything in this world. Nothing ever tastes the same. Hello. We can either go through this or see what is God trying to teach us through these moments. You know what is God teaching us? If you are with someone you love and loves you, it doesn't matter what's happening. Whether you're eating biryani or just tap water, whether you're in a mansion or in a, if you're with the person you love, you feel happy. God, through our own life, teaches us that and then says, you know what, oh, come, let's love me and I'll love you. If you manage to come to me and we build this relationship, no matter what happens, you'll be happy. In the same way that if you had a, even the worst food, but you're next to your mom after 10 years, you would be the happiest person. God says, if you're friends with me, it doesn't matter. Even if you drink a tap water, even if you, I don't know, just breathe, you'll be happy. Imagine, I don't say imagine if they told me, my son, this was our engagement day, and they said, you know what, your wife, your fiance gave you this water, right? The whole lecture I was honestly thinking about that water. Oh my God, she poured it? Wow, that's love. Hello, when you go to Hazrat, for example, Prophet Ibrahim, this is how he feels about God. He says, every drink of water I do, God gave it to me. Isn't that the truth? So if you love God, every glass of water you have, it's the sweetest thing in the world. Past this is why I'm saying the Ahl Bayt kept saying, go and fix your relationship with God. Imam Hussein is so beautiful in Dua Arafah when he wants to talk about God, who God is. He doesn't give you a lecture, God is wajibul wujud that has created this. No. Imam says, Rabbi be ma at'amtani. Rabbi be ma asqaytani. God is the one who gave me food. God is the one who gave me water. Alon, we have food, water on a daily basis. Does it make us happy? No. Why not? Because we're not getting it from someone we love. Ahl Bayt say, food in love with God, whatever comes in your life, it's the sweetest thing, the best thing in the world. Ilahi man dhalladhi dhaqa halawata mahabbatika farama min kabadala. Who is the one who tasted the sweetness of being with you then wanted anything else? It's so interesting. Dige, Ahle Bayt showed us that you don't need anything externally to be madly enjoying this life. Madly in love. Why? Well, that's another talk. But the summary of it is this. God says, you know what? I am with you wherever you are. God is saying, He is with you wherever you are. And what is God? God introduces himself to get al hay life. The source of life. The source of joy. The source of peace. The source of safety. All of this is God. And God says, I am with you wherever you are. So if you ever felt like life has to be different for me to have peace or be happy or feel like, God says, no, you've got it wrong. There is nothing you need to enjoy life. You just need to fix that relationship with God. No, I'm there with you. Well, inshallah, in the external world as well, go and achieve whatever you want. But la ilaha illallah, ultimately peace, safety, that feeling of I'm alive. Honestly, when was the last time some of us felt alive? And I have many friends my age, if they don't do their, by the way, no judgment about vaping, huh? it's apparently even better than smoking going on. But I'm saying if my friend says I can't feel alive unless I vape, I'm like, oh, maybe there's another way. I'm not really saying there's anything wrong with vaping, huh? Asan, that's not for me to say. Who am I to, you know? But I'm saying, Asan, in all of us, we're finding a way just to feel something. If you want to know the difference between us and someone who's getting life, just look at your children next time you take them to the park. Look at how much they're alive, how much we're alive. 
They run to the tree, they hug the tree, they enjoy the grass, they see a ladybug, they, you know, they're fully living life. And if we're not living life like that, if we have to find something, by the way, I'm really not judging anyone, we're all in this together, right? I'm not talking from someone who's like perfected life. No, honestly, I'm so happy you don't see the way I live. I'm saying mainly this to myself. But I'm seeing it as a person that to some extent, alhamdulillah, I've seen it. How life becomes different when God becomes in part of the equation. And before, I've been late and I'm speaking more than my time. This is terrible behavior. Let me just take one moment to make a small prayer. And if you feel like it um, in your heart, just join me in that prayer. May God, inshallah, You know, we spend some time remembering uh, our beautiful 11th Imam and his teaching for us. May, inshallah, if whatever light was in this session, because of the barakah of the light, may God, inshallah, enable us to feel his presence in our life. Because once that comes, from that day onwards, your life would be different. You never need to tell your children to pray and whatnot. Why? You enjoy your prayer so much, they will love to do it. That's how beautiful it is. May God, inshallah, enable us to follow the Ahl Bayt in the correct way that they wanted us to. And may, inshallah, God bless every single one of you, whether you're here or watching later on. May you feel God's presence. May your children God feel God's presence. And as a result of that, feel, inshallah, stronger in peace and have a feeling that life has a meaning and may inshallah some light be sent to all of our loved ones who've passed away and on that note thank you so much and uh, let's end with a beautiful salawat <laughs>